and thank you so much for joining today's special topic webinar, The Activated Arthritis Patient, excuse me, patient, hosted by Needy Med's partner, Creaky Joints. My name is Carla. I'm the Director of Education at Needy Med. And before we kick off today's presentation, I want to go over just a few points. You can feel free to type any questions you may have throughout the webinar into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just know that we will reserve answering questions until the end. If we don't have the time to answer your specific question, please know we will follow up with you personally via email after the webinar by tomorrow afternoon at the latest. But of course, we'll provide the contact information for both Needy Meds and Creaky Joints at the end of the webinar as well. I also want to let you know that both my PowerPoint presentation and more importantly, the Creaky, Creaky Joints PowerPoint presentation is a attach in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you have difficulty accessing that, don't hesitate to shoot me a message again in that questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel, or um, let me know after the webinar and I'd be happy to email it to you. This webinar is being recorded and we will convert it into a video to be uploaded onto the Needy Meds YouTube page soon. So with that, let's get started. For those of you that are not familiar with Needy Meds, I just want to do a little brief recap of who we are. What you're looking at now is a slide that simply has our mission statement. Simply put, Needy Meds is a national nonprofit that connects people to programs free and anonymously through our website and toll-free helpline to programs that will help them save or afford their health care expenses. And I always put a snapshot of our Needy Meds website because really our website is the face of our organization. With that being said, however, you also notice at the top there is that 800 number. So if you ever want to refer anybody to Needy Meds or you yourself are having difficulty finding cost assistance programs, don't hesitate to call our expert call center counselors at 1-800-503-6897. And you'll also notice on that screen on the top right hand of that home homepage screenshot, you'll see a bunch of social media icons. The third from the left is our link to our YouTube channel. I mentioned before that this webinar is being recorded and will be converted into a video. That's where you can find it. We try and get that up as quickly as possible. And it's worth checking out that channel anyway because we record all of our special topic webinars, so you may find something else you're interested in listening to. So as um, you might have seen, I, I brushed past that screen quickly, our actual mission statement in Needy Meds is that we are dedicated to educating and empowering people seeking affordable health care. And certainly we define that education portion of our mission by educating people about Needy Meds and the resources we have to offer by also letting them know about other ways to stay healthy, which is why we are so pleased to have our guest from Creaky Joints with us today. So first, before I pass the mic and the screen and introduce our guest, let me tell you a little bit about the organization Creaky Joints. Creaky Joints is a part of the nonprofit Global Healthy Living Foundation. And it was actually founded by an arthritis patient, Seth Ginsberg, and social entrepreneur, Louis Stark, in 1999, when Seth was an isolated co college freshman in his dorm, dorm room bunk bed thinking, where is everyone else who is going through this? Together, Lou and Seth started Creaky Joints, creating what has become today a robust and growing online patient community. You can find more about that, and I literally pulled that right from the Creaky Joints website because I think how it started and the grassroots efforts, which has grown into this robust online patient community, really is a testament to how crucial, um, how much of a priority Creaky Joints considers the, the people reaching out to them to be. So now I told you a little bit about Creaky Joints, so let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Our guest today is Dr. Shilpa Ventikachalam, and I am quite proud of myself because I think I pronounced um, Shilpa's last name correctly. And I will tell you, you can look at it in writing. It is, although it's long, it's pronounced exactly the way it's spelled. So thank you, Shilpa, for being so generous about my needing to practice that. But anyway, um, Shilpa is the Associate Director for Patient-Centered Research at Creaky Joints of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. She completed her undergraduate degree in Mumbai, India, 
And then she went on to earn a master's in literature from the University of Durham in the UK and earned her PhD in critical theory from the University of Nottingham in the UK and also has achieved an advanced master's in global health from New York University. I'll be honest with our audience, it was really difficult for me to pick and choose what I was going to um, share with you from Shilpa's resume. So I'm just going to throw out a few more facts. As you can see, it's quite impressive and why we're so thrilled to have her here with us today. Shilpa's previous work in healthcare has spanned public and private sectors across different countries, including India, West Africa, and across the U.S. And she has been invited as a panelist for presentations on global health topics by the Ambassadors Club at the United Nations. At Creaky Joint, Shilba leads the Patient Partners in Research, a group of patients with chronic and autoimmune conditions who are interested in engaging in clinical trials and research. So without further ado, and hopefully seamlessly, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to, to screen and screen to our guest, so bear with me while I do that. And there we go. And Shilpa, you should be able to take that away. As we're transferring the screen to our guests, just a reminder to everybody that if you do have questions, you can feel free to go ahead and type them into that question section of your GoToWebinar control panel at any time. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to our guests. Thanks and enjoy today's presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Car uh, Carla, for that very kind introduction. Um, and yes, great job on my on my last name. So hi everyone, this is Shilpa Venkatachal. I'm really happy to be uh, to be joining you all today on this webinar on the activated arthritis patient. And hopefully, I think everyone's able to uh, see my screen. But you're, if you're not having uh, if you're having trouble seeing my screen, do send a message and we can fix that. Just um, so thank you, Shilpa. Um, excuse me, everyone. Um, Shilpa, I wanted to give you the heads up that I can hear you. Clearly, I can see your screen. And a reminder, if you're having difficulty, as Shilpa said, you can send me a message in the question section. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's, uh, you know, I want to say thank you to Needy Meds for all the work that they do. Uh, we at Creaky Joints, I'm the Associate Director of Patient-Centered Research. As Carla mentioned, we are a patient-led organization. Many of us are patients ourselves. Uh, so so we, when we talk about arthritis, whether that's management, diagnosis, treatment, or advocating for ourselves, for yourself, uh, and the community, uh, a, lot, a lot of the talk comes also from experience in our own day-to-day -day, uh, lives, much like many of you uh, might be doing so yourselves. So with that, let's just quickly look at the agenda. We have a pretty full agenda, and I'm hoping uh, to hear some great questions from you, so feel free to send questions throughout the discussion. We'll talk a little bit about arthritis. There's, as you all probably know, there's a lot of misconceptions. So, uh, you know, when patients say, oh, I have arthritis, what are some of the things that people immediately assume, and why might some of those things not be altogether correct? We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll discuss the, uh, what patient-centered care is, and patient-centered research is, right? And the two of them go together because unless you yourself are advocating for yourself, for your community as a patient, uh, inadvertently, uh, in many ways, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, by advocating for yourself, you're impacting the community, whether that's in research, whether that's in advocacy. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a bit later. We'll talk a little bit also about how to inspire community participation. You know, the health, healthcare landscape today is changing greatly. The voice of the patient has become one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. So doctors, clinicians, researchers, 20 years ago, they were working in their labs, they were working in libraries, uh, putting out the publications. But today, more and more, researchers are beginning to realize that research cannot be done in the way that it used to be done before. Most importantly, we have to bring patients into the fold. So we'll talk a little bit about how patients can contribute to research. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about creaky joints, as the name suggests. Uh, we do deal with creaky joints ourselves and um, issues around creaky joints for others. We'll talk a little bit about arthritis Power, which is an app that we use. It's also a research registry. And then some of the advocacy initiatives we do through the 50 state network. 
So what is arthritis uh, is, is where we want to start. And, you know, this is, this is something that really fascinates everyone because the minute you say arthritis, someone has it or someone's grandfather has it or someone's niece has it, et cetera. But most people don't realize that arthritis is actually a term that includes over 100 distinct diagnoses, right? But the arthritis that comes to mind immediately when we say the word most often is osteoarthritis. It's the, the degenerative wear and tear that happens to joints as we age, as we get older, as we use our knees, uh, our legs more and more, right? But there's also an autoimmune component to, uh, to a class of diseases called autoimmune forms of arthritis. And these are rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout, which is often not looked at as arthritis, and these are uh, forms of arthritis that are caused by excessive inflammation within the joint. So it's, it's really interesting because in general, inflammation is the body's response to an injury. So it's actually protective when it works well, right? But in autoimmune forms of arthritis, what has happened is that the, auto, the immune system has gone a bit out of whack, right? It's not working quite as it should. And so the inflammation is going on excessively it doesn't stop right and so the body in a sense begins to attack itself it begins to attack its own joints its own tissues the synovial fluid that surrounds the joints etc and that is what causes these autoimmune kinds of arthritis the the other i think big misconception is that arthritis is something that happens to older people we always think of arthritis as something that happens to our grandfather or grandmother or someone who's beyond the age of 60 but unfortunately, uh, arthritis doesn't discriminate, right? So you have very little, we have babies who are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. You have teenagers and, uh, who are diagnosed with arthritis, and that's called juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So arthritis affects us all. It affects every age. It tends to affect every race. So for example, about 22.6% of Caucasians are today, in today's landscape, are diagnosed with arthritis. Very closely uh, followed by African Americans, 22.2% of African Americans are diagnosed with arthritis. 11.8% of Asians are diagnosed with some form of arthritis, and 15.4% of Latinos are by and large uh, diagnosed with some form of arthritis. What, the reason I'm, I'm, you know, talking about this is because it, arthritis is some, something that's going to affect us all in some way or the other, right? It's either going to affect us or it's going to affect someone we know. And so we have to all be proactively involved, either in raising awareness or in helping to advance research around arthritis. Two-thirds of the people diagnosed with arthritis tend to be women. And what we find often in our work in research is that women's concerns about arthritis tend to be in some ways different from what men's concerns, right? About uh, four point, sorry, let me just get this out of the way. Sorry, so arthritis, sorry about that. Arthritis also uh, has effects on how you can function, your daily physical ability to do tasks, whether that's opening a jar, turning on a faucet, reaching for things above your head, or, or reaching, for, uh, reaching for, you know, it could be a mug, a book, any of that kind of, any of those kind of tasks. So it really affects every aspect of our lives. It is Arthritis Awareness Month. Uh, May generally is Arthritis Awareness Month. And so, you know, part of our effort, you and me, when I say we, I'm talking about all of us, right? Part of our uh, effort in, uh, during Arthritis Awareness Month must be to, to bust some of the myths that are commonly held about arthritis. One of which we've already talked about is that arthritis can be diagnosed at any age. It does not affect just older people. Right Today, we have top-of-the-line medications. Research has advanced greatly in the past, I would say, 20 years. You know, we talk to patients who have been diagnosed with arthritis at very young ages and today who are in their 60s and 70s, and we've heard straight from them that when they were younger, they were taking just Advil or an NSAID, right, and ibuprofens and uh, 
and steroids or corticosteroids. Today, we have drugs called biologics, DMARDs, that can actually modify the course of the disease, right? DMARDs stands for disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. So these are drugs that not just suppress the pain and the stiffness, they actually change the course of the disease. They can actually halt progression of the disease, they can slow down joint damage. So these are really some uh, fa some fascinating research being done today in, in the field of arthritis treatment. And all these are available. I think the, the important thing is to get this information out there so that we know what is available to be able to make use of them. Um, another common myth is once you're diagnosed with, uh, with uh, arthritis, there is no way to slow down the damage that's caused by arthritis. Again, as I said just now, today we have top-of-the-line drugs that can, that can actually modify the course of the disease. So it can slow down uh, joint damage. It can actually sometimes even prevent further joint damage. Family history, I think this is a question that comes up again and again. My mother has arthritis, that, or rheumatoid arthritis. Does that mean I'm going to have arthritis? We hear women of childbearing age asking us, well, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis. What is the risk that my child may develop it? So um, what, what we've begun to understand in, in research within the arthritis field is, yes, there is a hereditary component, but there is a field today called epigenetics. Right? And what epigenetics teaches us is that there's environmental components and there's hereditary components. Environmental components are things like certain things that you can control, like your lifestyle choices, right? Uh, smoking, for example, is uh, something that's being studied very closely in terms of its impact on development of arthritis and related conditions. Diet, exercise, obesity. All of these things are, uh, are really clubbed into the environmental category. So there's, there's a combination of factors that work. You know, the way I like to explain it often, and I borrow this from, from another very well-known uh, researcher who I heard at one of the conferences, is that there's a switchboard. Think of it as a switchboard, right? There are, there are about 10 different switches that can get turned on and off right? And these are all the different causes, all the different risk factors uh, that might lead to the development of arthritis. So yes, you might have a family member who has arthritis. Yes, you might have a mother who's been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. It does not mean that you will develop arthritis. It might, it's a risk factor, but there are things that you can do to reduce your risk of developing the disease itself. So with that, I'm going to sort of, this is a nice segue into patient-centered outcomes research, something that I do, uh, I work very heavily in. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this uh, is because, you know, there are so many different myths about arthritis out there, right? One of which we just talked about is hereditary, the only risk factor. What we began to understand in the field of healthcare, and specifically in arthritis, is that we have two sets of information. One that comes from, clinical, from the clinical uh, side of things, from the doctor, from lab reports, from x-rays. There's another set of information, very, very important information that comes from the patient, directly from the patient, because it's the patient who is living with the disease day in and day out. So the voice of the patient began to gain a lot of importance in patient-centered, what is now called patient-centered outcomes research. And those little blocks that you see on my slide, those are the different chunks of patient-centered outcomes research. Together, they make up what we call PCOR or patient-centered centered outcomes research. What does it mean? It means that we have to bring in the voice of the patient rather than just focusing only on the clinical data. It means that we have to start putting emphasis on comparative effectiveness research. A medication that works for person A really well may not work so well for patient B. So I have to evaluate what medication or what treatment can work for me based on my preferences. What are preferences? Preferences might be fears, Right? Someone might like to take an injection. Someone might be really fearful of an injection. So what kinds of preferences might I have as a patient? 
depending on those preferences, how can I tailor my treatment, right? What kind of medications might work for me? I might have rheumatoid arthritis, but I might also have diabetes. Keeping that in mind, my treatment plan might be very different from someone who has psoriatic arthritis and say a cardiovascular condition. So that is what comparative effectiveness research focuses on. Patients have experiences that are unique to them and this can move clinical pursuit ahead. This comes from the whole idea that there is one set of data that comes from x-rays, from scans, from blood work, right? I can see my CRP levels in my blood work. I can see my ESR levels in my blood work. I can see my rheumatoid factor. But there is another key data that's missing. How do I measure fatigue? Think about it for a second. There's no measure in my blood work that tells me how I'm doing on fatigue. What about stiffness? There's nothing in my blood work that can communicate to the doctor that stiffness has increased in the past seven days for me, right? And these are really important pieces of the puzzle. In order to understand the disease fully, we have to combine clinical data with patient-centered data. So that, that's how we can move clinical pursuit ahead. Informed decision-making, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these different chunks. Informed decision-making based on personal characteristics, unless you and me know what is good for us, unless we know ourselves as patients, what our preferences are, what our fears are, what do we want to achieve? Less pain, less stiffness, what kind of side effects are we willing to put up with? Nausea, maybe, right? Diarrhea, maybe not. These are the kind of things that we have to work alongside our clinicians with in order to tailor a customized plan for our treatment. We've also learned that when patients work together with their doctors to develop a tailored plan, the likelihood of patients staying and sticking on that plan that they themselves have had input in developing tends to be higher. So the, the, the whole centerpiece, I think, of patient-centered outcomes research remains how can I work with clinicians and health systems to help make the best decisions about my health and healthcare. And, you know, I cannot stress to you the importance of you as a patient, when you go to your doctor and give him all this information, whether that's about pain or fatigue or brain fog, what you're actually doing is not just talking about yourself. You're actually communicating for an entire community of other patients with arthritis because it is only through the patient the doctor can understand things about arthritis that he cannot see on a blood work report or on an x-ray scan. So this leads us nicely into something called treat to target. Once you know yourself as a patient, um, you work with the physician. The whole idea of treat to target is that patients and physicians work together to set specific goals for patients' response to drug therapy or treatment. Again, your set of goals may be very different to the doctor's set of goals, right? So you might go into your rheumatologist's office or your doctor's office and you might tell him, I have a lot of pain and stiffness. My goal is to be able to open a jar next week, by next week, without feeling pain in my wrist, right? The doctor might then look at you and say, okay, well, let's look at what your blood work is showing. Your ESR is high, your CRP is high, your other measures are high. So let's work on lowering these, these inflammation markers. And perhaps then that will bring down the pain and you'll be then able to open that jar that you're talking about. So in actuality, your goals are in line with the clinician's goals. It's just that the way you measure them are, tend to be different. The clinician is looking at the blood work, at the x-rays to get those into control. You're experiencing the pain, you're experiencing the fatigue, you're experiencing the brain fog. And so your whole idea, your whole goal, all your goals are related around the experiential, um, the experiential component of that blood work, of the blood work inflammation markers. And that is all treat to target is. It's working alongside the doctor to achieve those goals, to set those goals. And, you know, I just want to say the goals can be anything. You don't have to, the goal doesn't have to be something far in the future, five years from now. 
right? You don't, your goal doesn't have to be remission. Your goal can be just opening a jar can. Your goal can be reaching out to get something from your kitchen cabinet or from a bookshelf without experiencing too much pain or stiffness. Your goal can be getting out of bed in the morning and taking 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes. Right. But those are goals you need to communicate to your doctor because the doctor will then tailor the treatment, right? Your your drug, whether he's giving you a biologic or a DMARD, he will tailor the treatment so as to see the results in your blood work so that you can then feel the effects in your everyday life. So one of the most important things then is to ask yourself before you go in to your doctor on a regular basis, because these, these things tend to change. Ask yourself, what kind of patient are you, right? And there's no right or wrong about this question. There's no right or wrong answers. You might be, uh, different patients are different, and, and hence you need to communicate to your doctor things that matter to you, right? What, what you work to get, what do you want to work to get under control? Pain, is that more important than getting the stiffness under control? Let your doctor know that. Are you willing to deal with bothersome side effects? What kind of side effects do you think are bothersome, right? Do you, do you think you can deal with nausea but not diarrhea? Do you think the, um, you want to see effects that your drug has within one week? Or are you someone who's willing to wait and give it a little more time, say four to six weeks? According to all these kinds of questions and answers, you and your doctor can work together to make a customized plan. Medication administration is, is a big one, right, for patients. So your doctor might say, hey, there's this fantastic new drug. Why don't you try it? And you might want to ask, well, how do I take this drug? Is it injectable? Do I need to inject myself? Do I need to take time off from work or take time off from dropping my kids at school or picking them up and come to an infusion center? Do I need to get infused? Is it a pill? Do I need to take the pill every day? Right? These are the kind of questions you need to ask again and again to your doctor. Don't be shy to ask your doctor this. Because once you do, what it means is you're involved in tailoring and designing your own treatment alongside your doctor. And that is what Treat to Target is all about. Get involved, get involved, get involved so that you can achieve the goals that you want to set for yourself and work with your doctor. The, the onset of action and the risk of serious infections is a particularly uh, important one for several reasons. You know, the way risk is communicated tends to be very different for patients as, uh, as opposed to doctors, right? Your doctor might tell you, well, there's one in 100% uh, chance, in a one in 100, sorry, a one in 100 chance that you might contract a serious infection, like shingles, for example, right? But that you might be thinking as a patient, well, that one could be me. Right? So if you have that fear, communicate that to the doctor. There's nothing wrong in communicating that because that will then make your doctor think about, okay, well, let's address this fear. Let's see how we can uh, circumvent and, and surmount this fear so that we can tailor the best possible method for you. So with that, I'm going to turn my attention now to arthritis being your own advocate and what you can do in order, how, how can you communicate all these things to your doctor, right? We've talked a lot about being involved, communicating your fears, uh, keeping uh, track of your pain and fatigue so you can communicate that too to your doctor. But very often we forget, right? It's not so easy to remember how I've been feeling in the past seven days. I might go into my rheumatologist or my clinician every two months or every three months. Well, then how am I supposed to remember how I was doing over the past two months? So it's important to keep track of your pain, of your fatigue, of your sleep, right? Because these things change. They go up, they go down. Sometimes you're having a flare. It may be particularly bad one week. You might have done something different and it might be particularly better the next week. So you want to keep track of your symptoms. And we have something called the Arthritis Power app, which is also a research registry. And I'll talk about that component in a bit too. But one of the features of Arthritis Power of the app itself is that you can track your pain, you can track your fatigue. So you can actually record every day 
or every month or every week how you're feeling, how you're uh, able to perform everyday activities, whether that's walking two miles or the, that's opening a jar or that's buttoning your clothes, right? You can record these things. Uh, we have something in the app called assessments, which are basically sets of questions around specific topics, pain, fatigue, what we call domains. So you can record that and you can actually show that to your doctor and say, you know, here, here it is. I've recorded how I've been feeling in the time period before I uh, came to see you and my last appointment. And let's refer to this to see how I've been doing. The other thing that we offer through the app uh, because it's a research registry is research opportunities. And these research opportunities are mainly patient-centered research opportunities, right? So before about, you know, a decade, even as early as a decade ago, when we talked about research, we talked about the patient sort of, we're not talking about traditional research anymore, uh, right? So about 10 years ago, we were talking about research in terms of, oh, try a new medication and tell us how you feel or join this clinical trial. But that's not what research is today. Today, by contributing how you're feeling on an everyday basis or on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis, whatever, if that's your choice, you're already contributing to research because you're actually sharing that information, the data that you're providing about your pain, about your fatigue with researchers who are beginning to understand the different trends, the different ways that patients feel on different medications um, through the app, right? We also have ability and capacity for you to participate on different research projects. Some research projects are surveys, some are more long-term um, projects, some are paid, some are unpaid. So there's, there's very many different ways in which your voice as a patient can be heard by participating in research. And we really encourage you and everyone around you to, to become an active advocate, an active member of the research community. We use the word today in science called citizen scientist, right? So it's not the doctor alone, it's not the researcher alone who sits at the table, it's the patient. The patient is an equal stakeholder. The patient sits alongside the clinician, alongside the, uh, the cl uh, researcher in order to not just participate in studies, but to have a say in what kind of studies should be done. And this is what this is this screenshot here, this slide here will is basically what the app looks like, right? We have a list of questions. So, for example, on uh, the second uh, the second shot of the mobile phone, there shows you how much pain have you had because of your condition over the past week, and you can actually record that. It will save it. It will generate eventually to you a score. So you'll get a score, and you can actually keep track of that score to see how you're doing over weeks or over months, or even you might even want to take it every day for some for a short period of time. So that's entirely up to you. Because Arthritis Power, the app and the research registry is a research registry, we, we do have a very uh, sort of short consent form that we ask all participants to sign. This is basically to allow you to provide you with the information really about what arthritis power is, right? To also provide you information about the kinds of studies we do and to let you know that you don't have to participate in every study. In fact, you might not want to participate in any study at the beginning. You might want to just track your symptoms, right? The idea is that yes, we'd like for you to participate in research because your voice is important, but you can choose which study you want to participate in. In fact, you can even start a study and then if you're not com comfortable providing information, you may even stop that study, right? So do take a look. I, I encourage you and ask us questions. Please feel free to reach out to me or to anyone at, at my organization. would be happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about the app as well. So just to give you an idea of some of the studies we do, and I'm, I'm sort of keeping an eye on the clock as well here. So I'll go through these pretty quickly. We have, currently we have about 10 to 15 studies on the way with arthritis power. Some of them are around what kinds of diets, right? Mediterranean diet, does that have an impact on pain, on stiffness, on fatigue, on inflammation? Um, mindfulness, this is something that we're doing with several other universities and health systems across the country. Does doing mindfulness in a structured way have an impact on 
arthritis on your inflammation what about the effect of different medications does that is one medication better than the other for say one specific sem symptom but not necessarily for another symptom what about the disease burden access to care right how do patients living with psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis deal with everyday realities whether whether and also emotional and mental mental health issues so those are just some of the uh, some kinds of research that we do within arthritis power there are many many more and again we can provide you more information uh, so feel free to reach out to me after this webinar we do also have we have an online community so creaky joints is really an online community uh you are part of an arthritis community when you join creaky joints we have over 38,000 subscribers now in creaky joints from across the country the idea is to leverage social media platforms whether that's facebook whether that's twitter whether that's blog so that we can not only support one another but we can learn from one another and we can contribute to research at the same time. One of the one thing that I will talk a little bit about is we've come out with these guidelines. So I don't know how many of you are familiar, but there is something called the American College of Rheumatology. The American College of Rheumatology puts out a guideline called the clinical guidelines. Right? We have in collaboration with several other uh, clinicians and researchers and East and American College of Rheumatology, we've translated some of that language in very simple language for patients to understand, right? For us to be able to navigate our disease journey as we move, say, from one biologic to another. What should we expect, right? Uh, what kind of other complementary treatments can I try? what about insurance something that we all deal with constantly what about step therapy issues something that we might all have to deal with so those are the kind of things that we build into these guidelines they're all available online they're free to download please use them they're a great resource for you uh, to really to guide the patient in their day-to-day -day challenges with that specific disease that they're dealing with we also host something called creaky chats in fact on creaky chats we asked our patient community so tell us what what kind of research topics you're interested in and patients sent us a whole list of topics that they were interested in some were interested in diet some were in, interested in complementary therapy some were interested on the effect that medications may have on pregnancy we took all those topics back to researchers back to clinicians and we told them this is what patients are interested in that is what relevant research is all about. It should make a difference. And then we sat the clinicians, we sat with researchers. Some of those topics turned into grants. We wrote out the proposals and we're working on some of them as research topics, which we will then bring back to our patient community. We also work to change and to make our voice heard at the policy level, whether that's state, uh, state le legislation or federal legislation. And that is what the 50 state network is all about. It's really a grassroots um, uh, attempt to mobilize patients, right, to make changes at the policy level, whether that's to do with step therapy, prior authorization, uh, access to medications, et cetera. So you can get involved in those kind of activities too. So there's research on, on the one hand, there's advocacy on the other hand. Both, of course, have a lot of crossovers. We all work together. But, but these are just some of the ways in which you can get involved in Creaky Joints. With that said, just a few, a few things to conclude this talk is it is Arthritis Awareness Month, and it is a difficult disease to deal with, right? We have to deal with it day in and day out. It's not something that takes a rest. It's not something that goes away. So, you know, part of the reason we have an online community, part of the reason we do policy, part of the reason we do research is to really help patients with the ABCs of arthritis. The A is accepting the diagnosis. It's very difficult when you're first told you have rheumatoid arthritis, this is a chronic condition. You have psoriatic arthritis. This also might affect your skin, for example. It's very difficult to accept it. So the first step is to accept your diagnosis until you accept it you cannot make steps right to to begin to manage it and so we, we provide a lot of support through our creaky joints community through the research work we do to say you're not alone in this you'll never be alone because there is a community and you can 
take support from that community. Once you take support from that community and gain the strength, you can in fact provide input into research and provide that same support to someone else who might be having difficulty accepting their diagnosis. So it's a very proactive accepting of the diagnosis. The second thing is to build bridges. It's not a defining characteristic. It is at the beginning when you're diagnosed and you have to say, I have rheumatoid arthritis or I have psoriatic arthritis, I have gout. But that's not the only thing you are all about, right? And there is a support system that you can reach out to. But, you know, most people might not know what it means to have a condition that you have to live with day in and day out, might not know what it means to deal with the side effects from the medications that you're taking. So the, the most important thing uh, with building bridges is to allow people an opportunity to learn and who better to learn from the patient themselves. So one of the ways to build the bridges is to learn about your illness and then educate your support network about the illness itself. Create opportunities, find a local, uh, find your local community center or an organization, right? Create a support group within your community and then reach back to us or reach back to Creaky Joins and we can all work together. So, you know, local is global. So we start off local and then we keep going and keep going and at some point we, we will make a difference, right? And don't settle. You, don't, you, you do have the ability to put yourself at the center of your arthritis care. Just because uh, treatment is given to you, you don't have to think that's the only treatment option, the only medication option available. Don't be shy to ask questions. Ask questions about what else is available. What happens if this medication stop, stops working? What's my next option? So don't settle for anything less than what you think is the best for yourself. And finally, it is Arthritis Awareness Month. So we have to do everything we can with full steam, not just this month, but throughout the year, but particularly this month, right, about to create and to raise awareness about arthritis. Talk to your family members. Talk to your friends. Don't assume they're not going to understand. Don't assume they're not interested. Talk about how arthritis impacts your life, your everyday life, even if that means washing dishes, doing laundry, putting the vacuum on and off, right? Those are things that matter. They're not trivial things. Find a community. Community is what will give you strength. Join a walk. Participate in creaky chats. There's no, Hundreds of people who join us on Creaky Chats. It happens on the first Monday of every month. You can join us. We can send you more information. You can ask questions. You can respond to questions. You can provide topics for research. And you can be part of the community all the time while doing that. Attend a local support group. There's all you have to do is search online. And if there isn't one, start one yourself. Think about starting one yourself. Set new goals for yourself. Don't give up. Every day say to yourself, you can and you will and keep going. And if there are days when you feel like you cannot, that's fine too. But then find a way to pick yourself up and keep going. And if you can't, then turn to support because that's when you need the support. So with that, I, I think I've provided quite a lot of information. I, I hope you all found that very interesting. I do want to say, you know, without patients today, the healthcare, healthcare landscape is nothing. So today more than ever the voice of the patient is what matters and so it's an appeal to all patients to caregivers to join in the fight in the in the fight against arthritis but to join also in advancing clinical research and our understanding of the disease itself thank you very much thank you so much shilpa i'm going to go ahead and grab the screen back from you now um and i want to thank you of course for taking time to share your expertise with the needy meds audience can you see my screen now yes Should i can fantastic and again thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with the needy meds audience um i think everybody will now agree why needy meds is so proud to be a partner of creaky joints um, anytime you visit their website join one of their chats you really walk away not only more educated but i would i would go a step further and say really empowered. So I hope that you do take the opportunity of checking out their organization a little bit more. And as Shilpa said, an underlying theme in today's message is not only empowering yourself and becoming active, but recognizing when you take that step, you're shedding light on this really important 
and challenging diagnosis. So you're not only doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for other arthritis patients, their caregivers, and their family as well. I do see a bunch of questions coming in, which is fantastic, and I'll encourage everybody to go ahead and submit those questions. And again, you can do that via the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. I will remind everybody of my disclaimer, which is that if we don't get the, the chance to answer your specific question, we will follow up with you personally via email by tomorrow at the latest. What you're looking at on your screen now is just a snapshot of some of the most effective and popular needy meds cost savings programs. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I would hope that you would also consider, in addition to creaky joints, needy meds not only a support, um, a source of education support, but also as hopefully an organization that will get rid of uh, another important barrier, which is the ability to save on or afford the medication and healthcare cost expenses that you may be facing with any diagnosis. So I encourage you to visit our website or again, call our expert call center counselors. That number will be at the end of the presentation, but it's 1-800-503-6897. And since I've got your attention, I'll remind you also to check out other upcoming webinars, and you can register for those on the bottom right hand of the Needy Meds homepage is a calendar of events. And of course, all our webinars are free. And again, you can find all of our pre-recorded ones, or excuse me, previously recorded ones on our YouTube channel. With that, I'm going to, as promised, if my PowerPoint presentation will cooperate with me, just put the contact information for Needy Meds and those links to Creaky Joints and Arthritis Power up there for you. Um, so, Shilpa, we do have a bunch of questions coming in. And again, everybody, if we don't get yours, don't worry, we'll follow up with you via email. Are there One of the questions coming in from our audience member is, if there is a history of arthritis, your mother or your grandmother has it, is there something you can do to reduce your own risk? That's a great question. Um, and yes, there is. The, uh, the short answer to that is yes. So like I said, the thing, the thing with autoimmune kinds of arthritis and arthritis, osteo, osteo kinds of arthritis, so degenerative arthritis, is we're still learning about it every single day. What we've learned so far is that there's different risk factors. So while hereditary, and so if your mother has it or your father has it, is a risk factor, there are things that you can do to minimize your risk of getting arthritis. And those factors have to do with the environment, right? Your lifestyle, exercise in plenty, get good food, eat, eat a healthy diet, lots of greens, things like that, smoking behaviors, alcohol intake, things like that you can do in order to modify your risk of contracting or, or sorry, of getting arthritis. There are several, several things that you can do. Um, and again, I encourage you to read evidence-based research. We know that there's a lot of information coming out every day about what you should and should not do, but there are definitely lifestyle factors that you can do, that you can incorporate into your everyday life in order to reduce the risk. Great. Thank you to our audience member for asking that important question and Shilpa for that thorough answer. And as Shilpa just had um, stressed, you know, things are changing all the time, which is the good news. So be, do be sure to check in with Creaky Joints to stay up to date. Another great question coming in is, let's say you've been diagnosed with arthritis. Uh, can you share some insight on a few first steps, such as what doctor do you need to see? if you have tips on finding a good one, and are there any initial blood tests that you should request or other diagnostic testing? So um, I, that's a mouthful there, Shilpa, so I'll let you answer the first part of that, which is what type of doctor do you see and do you have tips about finding a good one? These are fantastic questions. And actually, I wish I had spoken about this as well because this is really important. Once you start recognizing symptoms, don't ignore your symptoms. Your first call would probably be your PCP, right? You can ask for a referral to someone called a rheumatologist. A rheumatologist is someone who deals with autoimmune and rheumatic diseases. So if it may be an autoimmune kind of arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, spondyloarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, gout, 
these are uh, these are some of the or lupus for that matter the rheumatologist is who you will need to see but a good place to start is to talk with your PCP your primary care person develop a good relationship a solid relationship with your primary care uh, practitioner talk to your primary care practitioner about what symptoms you might be experiencing and allow work with the pri primary care practitioner to figure out the next steps what kind of blood tests you might want there is a blood test that you can there are several different blood tests right they can do a complete blood count etc to understand where to go next but your PCP that is your primary contact from there your PCP will refer you to either a rheumatologist or another specialist that he might think it's necessary for you to see. Fantastic. And I'm do, I am glad that our audience member asked that because it is an important factor in this Agreed. entire yes. process. And I think it's a great opportunity also to um, stress the app arthritis power that Creaky Joints offers because probably once you meet with your primary care physician or you're forwarded on to whatever specialist it might be, I'm sure it'll be very helpful to have an accurate tracking of your symptoms and what you've been dealing with. Another question, actually a couple uh, of questions coming sorry, in. Sorry, Carla, can sure. I just, oops, sorry, I, I just, there was another question in that previous question that I did want to uh, touch upon, which was also a great question. Once you do have your diagnosis, what do you do? You begin to learn about your condition. And, uh, you know, we have on Creaky Joints several resources. It's very important to understand your disease so that you're not thrown off by it, so that you're not scared by it or fearful by it, because that is the first thing that hits the patient when they're diagnosed. Like, oh my God, this is a condition I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. So I think the first thing after your diagnosis is to reach out to other patients through online support, creaky joints, or to look for information. Evidence-based information is very important. Look for evidence-based information about the disease condition itself so that you can manage it better. Thank you, Carlo. Fantastic, thank you, Shilpa. The next couple of questions coming in um, really relate to diet and supplements. And I'm not sure if this is something that you can speak to, Shilpa, considering where your expertise lies, um, but we have some audience members asking whether or not there are any recommendations for supplements or, or a more specific change in the diet, such as changing to an alkaline diet. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to those two points. Again, great question. And uh, this is a really popular question, actually, that comes uh, that we get all the time from patients. I do want to say I am not a medical doctor, and I, uh, you know, I want to refrain from providing any medical evidence. What I can talk to is what we see in the research, right? And the research is constantly sort of changing and growing as we're understanding more and more about these diseases. We have seen in research that a healthy diet is really important, and by healthy. Uh, we mean, you know, a vegetable for, uh, sorry, a plate full of vegetables and fruits, a, a diet that's rich in fruit and vegetable, um, avoiding, uh, sort of reducing the, the deep fried, the fast food, the processed food, those kinds of things, right? But you might want to talk to a dietitian, someone who specializes in um, what the best diet is for your condition, because for each person, the diet, dietary restrictions might differ. So you, again, you might want to find a very tailored plan that might work for you. As far as supplements are concerned, same thing. We don't have, again, I'm not a medical doctor, and so I cannot provide the medical advice on this. But what we have seen is, yes, there are patients who do use supplements, whether that's fish oil or vitamins, etc. There are patients who don't. Um, so again, that is something that you might, these are exactly the kind of questions that you want to bring to your doctor when you meet with your doctor. Don't be shy to ask these questions. Um, this is exactly what it means to be involved in your, in the treatment of your disease condition. Great. And I, and I really appreciate, Shopa, how much you're stressing that, that really whatever question our audience member has, it's important. It's probably something somebody else is struggling with as well, and it's essential to bring it up to your primary care physician or the specialist you've been referred to. We have time for just one more question, and this person is writing in because um, surgery has been recommended. 
how do you know when surgery is needed? Should, should the next step be getting a second opinion? Um, can you just speak to that? And again, of course, to our audience members with that disclaimer that our guest is not a medical doctor, but she can speak to if there's any research that she'd like to bring to your attention. Thanks, Shilpa. Absolutely. And again, I, I cannot stress uh, the the value of these questions. These, these are just exactly the questions that we want to study and research. So what you think of as a personal question is actually a question that is very pertinent to the research that we're doing. On the topic of surgery, we just completed a, um, a project called Better Said, and it's a very, very, the acronym uh, will suffice for now because the full form is really long. But basically, we did a project on um, hip and joint, uh, hip and knee replacements uh, and surgeries around those. So again, these, whether or not to have surgery, that is a PCORI question. That's a patient-centered research or outcome question, right? What you want to do is figure out if at that point, right, if you're experiencing pain in the knee or if you have a shoulder joint that's not quite working properly, you want to figure out alongside your clinician, your specialist, your care team, whether or not it is appropriate to have surgery. I think more than whether or not to have surgery, um, that's a question for your for your doctor to answer. What I can tell you is there are questions that you might want to bring to your doctor when you're discussing surgery. Things like, how is this surgery going to benefit me? What are the risks of this surgery, of having this surgery? Is this, are there chances that I might have to have this surgery over again, like a revision surgery, right? How is this going to impact my life? Is it going to give me more mobility? What kind of, if you're having an implant fixed into your knee or your hip, what kind of implant is it? Um, how big is the implant? What, is it going to change how I walk? Is it going to change how I move? Those are exactly the questions that you might want to ask and bring to your clinician, to your specialist before going ahead and making the decision along with your clinician. Thank you again, Shilpa, for that really thorough response and to our audience members to bringing it to Shilpa's attention. Um, I'm going to wrap up with actually, I had a few people in our audience write in about coverage for particular medication or even certain types of shots and whether or not um, how to get that covered. Um, what I, I can't speak to that, but what I can remind our audience members is that if you are having an obstacle affording your healthcare needs, please do turn to Needy Meds. And again, you can visit our website or call our expert call center counselors at that 800 number. And hopefully, they'll be able to connect you to a program that will alleviate some of the financial burden if you don't have access to, to the health coverage you need, which unfortunately is a very common thing that all of us are dealing with at the moment. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. I'll remind everybody that you can download both of the PowerPoint presentations, if, including mine, but more, much more importantly, Shilpa's, in that handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. We also do hope that you stay in touch with Creaky Joints and Needy Meds, and of course, join us for any of our upcoming other special topic webinars. Thank you so much for joining us, and Shilpa, thank you so much for your sharing, again, your very thorough and impressive expertise with the Needy Meds audience. We look forward to welcoming you back for a repeat webinar. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Carla. Thank you to Needy Meds as well from us and a wonderful audience. So thank you. Big thank you to the audience as well. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Take care.